encourage the VCs who invested in those companies five or six years ago to think that that's a good good investment proposition. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about your pipeline? Um, where do you see new medicines coming from? Are you looking to acquire more, or partner more, or license more, or how is the internal R and D going? So, for for a while now, GSK has uh, pursued a model that is highly based on externalization and licensing. So that's not to the uh, to neglect internal R and D, but just mm -hmm. to say if if we are investing a percentage of the world's R&D, it's unreasonable for us to expect that of necessity we'll, we'll get a larger percentage of the medicines out of it. So in order to do that we need to go and find out where those medicines are being developed and, and partner with them or license or acquire them. And that's been our strategy now for 10 years since, since the merger, mm -hmm. uh, very successfully. A very significant percentage of our late stage pipeline is, is partnered in one form or another and many of those partnerships go back decades. Uh, and then in our early stage pipeline we've been aggressively externalizing it on, on the basis of being world class where we can be and where we can't, find somebody who is and partner with them. And that's been the sort of predominant philosophy uh, within GSK and we've done that by taking our early stage pipeline and breaking it down into very small groups which you know, because we have to have a nice acronym for everything we call discovery performance units DPUs and DPUs are five to fifty people so they really are small they're, they're actually we think of them like small biotech companies mm -hmm. key thing about a DPU is you repersonalize discovery so the head of that DPU is responsible for what happens in that group. And that group does everything from selecting a target all the way through to clinical proof of concept or commit to medicine development. So clinical trials, probably phase two. Mm -hmm. So, and these DPUs are focused on a particular area, say muscle metabolism. So it's not a therapy area, it's an aspect within a therapy area. Each DPU puts up a business plan mm -hmm. and we invest in the business plan. And the business plan might last three years. So the DPU will come and they'll say, if you give me X, then I will develop this, and this is where you could see the pipeline being over time. And some of that, in some of them, almost all of it, is sourced externally, and some of them, where they have particular strengths internally, will be a combination of internal and external, and some of them are more internal than external. And overall, uh, we have roughly 50% of our early stage pipeline is partnered in one form or another. So are there aspects of, uh, or thera therapeutic areas or aspects of therapeutic areas that are of particular uh, emphasis or interest for GSK? So we, we exited uh, a number of therapy areas uh, a couple of years ago, two years ago, and those were the areas that we judged on the basis of a review of where the novel science was, were not likely to be highly productive or prolific in terms of what they could produce. Mm -hmm. uh, and and this is to break the old cycle, which is simply because I'm present in a the therapy area, therefore I must invest in the R&D for that therapy area. Yeah, that, that's what's actually one of the reasons that the pharma industry is in the place where it's at, is because we've invested in R&D according to what we're currently selling, as opposed to mm -hmm. where the opportunities are. So we broke that and we divested from a number of therapy areas. But I think our view would be that within each therapy area, it's not about saying I'm in this therapy area and not in that therapy area. It's about saying within that therapy area, where, where is the unmet need and what could I credibly produce as an intervention that would meet that unmet need? So for example, I um, found it very difficult as an industry to produce drugs for obesity, but actually obesity is huge killer around the world mm -hmm. and massive unmet medical need and that is only likely to get worse as the population wealth increases and uh, ages and so what's like so what would be needed is a truly uh, a truly um, innovative and value creating medicine for obesity so what does that look like so in obesity the fact that it hasn't got there it does not mean you shouldn't be targeting it it means you've got to say what 
what what would make a difference and where is the science telling me that I could actually physically feasibly do that so for example in obesity if you look at gastric bypass surgery you see a number of really interesting things with gastric bypass surgery you see 30% weight loss in a good chunk of the patients uh -huh. you see resolution within a matter of days or weeks of diabetes where, where those patients many of whom have diabetic are diabetic as well and you see a whole rebalancing of uh, lipids etc in the body so that tells you that there's something really quite interesting going on in when you do a gastric bypass that's not simply stopping people eating uh -huh. it, it's a more fundamental uh, effect physiological effect if there is a way of mimicking that from a pharmacological perspective you could produce a very profound effect in diabetes uh, in, and, and also in obesity. So, but you need to look at making a step change because simple reduction of HbA1c is not going to be enough to get a diabetes medicine uh, approved. Simple reduction in body weight of you know, a few percent, which then rebounds, is not going to be enough to get, make it a safe and effective drug for obesity. But if you can profoundly affect these conditions, uh -huh. then it is. And so the critical question is, where is the science telling you that now the time is ripe to profoundly affect those conditions? I would argue in areas like obesity, you could argue it's there. There are other areas, for example Alzheimer's, where I think we're a little way off yet, but I think there's some fascinating basic research that could tell you that maybe in a few years' time there'll be there'll be enough impetus for change in, in that area too, and obviously massive unmet medical need there too. Mm -hmm. So you've got to look at a combination of unmet medical need and your ability from uh, looking at the science to think that you can make an impact, and that's where we need to.